May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In his late 20s, a Jewish peasant, a carpenter, descended from the hills of Nazareth, arrived at a crossroad in the Galilee Valley, took a right turn and walked 40 miles to begin his ministry beside a large lake named the Sea of Galilee. Sometime in the third decade of the first century, he began building his ministry team along the lake shore. There were 12 at the core. They were a motley crew, nine fishermen, a tax collector, a missionary from Armenia, and one whose only infamous claim was traitor, a title later changed for betrayer. They had a certain special fish-like odor about them for the most part. They tried hard to follow. They gave it their all, though they really seemed to struggle with how best to follow their leader. Beyond the 12, there were thousands who loved to listen to him. They showed up when they could. They came for healings. They needed miracles in their lives. Like the 12, they often struggled to pay attention and follow. In the end, almost every single one of them would abandon him rather than follow him. But this Nazarene peasant, filled with love, with truth, with justice and faith, this God-shining light simply talked with people. He taught them. He healed them. He led them to God's light, to God's life, to God's love. He was always pointing to God. People had a tough time getting this, but he never stopped showing them God. There along the lake shore, this man named Jesus spent three years teaching, preaching, and healing like none before him and none to follow. When he preached, he sat down as was the practice among first century Palestinian rabbis. Crowds gathered close around him to receive his blessings, to hear his words. Crowds always touched Jesus' heart. He saw each person in the crowd and he knew what they needed. They needed what he had. What he had to share was love and grace, was justice and mercy. He really opened his heart to them. And that is why so many flocked to sit at his feet on the hillside surrounding the lake. He spoke to their hearts and their concerns for daily living. He was not a preachy type. He was not flamboyant like others who had come before him or those who would follow using his name. There was something qualitatively different about Jesus. He was real. He was sometimes funny, but he was never phony. It was clear to all opponents and supporters in this man of Nazareth, the spirit of God was on fire. His soul was lit up and the light shining out of him was brilliant. When they left the hillsides and the seaside, people began to call him names. A few in derogatory ways, but mostly they called him the son of God. Is it any wonder? Their words about him reflected the reality of God's light they saw beaming out of him. Just outside Capernaum, the north, northernmost seaside town, he preached his first recorded sermon. It was later written down and has been shared for the past 2,000 years. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. But it was more like a talk from the hilltop. There on the windswept hilltop west of town, he talked with the crowds about what really mattered. He pointed them to the stairway of the spiritual life. He called them blessed. He gave them the keys to the kingdom of God. He said, you are blessed when you are poor in spirit. You are blessed when you have a deep concern for others. You are blessed when you sur surrender your will so that God's will may rise and shine. You are blessed when you get up each morning and you are hungry and thirsty to do the right thing. You are blessed 
when you have an attitude of compassion toward all people and they end up wanting to share compassion with others too. You are blessed when you are pure from the inside out. You are blessed when you don't just talk peace, but you become peace to others. We call these the Beatitudes. Jesus called them the way my followers must be in the world. It was clear and remains clear to this day. When you are blessed, you become a blessing to others. He was very clear. To be poor in spirit, to mourn, to be meek, to be merciful, to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness, to be pure in heart and to be peace, all come at a cost. To follow him was not then, nor is it to this day, a walk in the park. Rather, to follow Jesus is to carry a lit candle on a hill and a windswept hilltop. He made very few promises, but one promise he made was this. When you follow him, you will face mockery and bullying. When you do the right thing, someone will spit in your face or assail your name for doing the right thing. And in other words, he was saying to be a light shining daughter or a light shining son of the living God means someone is always going to try to blow out your light. That's the cost of discipleship. Nevertheless, and our faith is always lived in nevertheless, we must do the right thing. And in our heart of hearts, we know when right is right. And in such right doing, through such vulnerability and beauty, God's light will shine on you and in you and through you to others. But there is another side to being vulnerable and a light shining before God in the presence of your neighbors. In doing the right thing, you will also experience the joy of discipleship. True joy comes in serving others and walking with God. And Jesus reminded everyone, no one can ever take your joy from you. These teachings known as the Sermon on the Mount were about a total way of life faithfully lived out in God's realm, built on the law of Moses, more than they were lessons reflecting good ideas to think about or reflectively ponder and passively step around. To follow this path, to do as Jesus did, would lead to no less than eternal life. The founder of Koinonia Farms, a farmer and a Greek theologian, pioneer of racial unity and biblical theology, Clarence Jordan said about the Sermon on the Mount, this is not a sermon. These are the lessons on the Mount. There's a difference between a sermon and a lesson. A sermon is something you sleep through and tell the preacher you enjoyed. <laughs> but a lesson, that just woke you up, didn't it? <laughs> but a lesson is something which is a sign and for which you are held responsible. You don't sleep through lessons. So let's go with lessons. It will keep you awake, but it'll also keep you honest. Often called the preamble of the lessons, the first 12 verses are still known as the Beatitudes. Some like to call them the B attitudes. Others like to say the happy attitudes. Others say the blessings. And most will acknowledge congratulations, which is actually the true translation of the word. Eight lessons that set a virtuous course for the rest of the sermon, the stairway to heaven, if you will. In Luke, the writer called people blessed when they are poor. Matthew ponder, uh, broadens this understanding by offering this blessing to those who are poor in spirit. With this, Matthew exposes those who are powerless over the shadow side of their lives. Their poor in spirit ha ha does not allow them to save themselves, no matter what their economic plight or economic status. Matthew's words draw in all humanity. No one can walk away from facing poverty of spirit. Although lack of money or economic resources may define the poor in spirit, it may not as well. The poor in spirit are opposite of the proud in spirit. Whether economically or spiritually poor, Jesus clearly pointed out that the poor in spirit are those aware of their needs for spiritual resources. And as such, they're open and welcome to God's heavenly realm. 
on earth as in heaven. The poor in spirit know they need God. They know they need what Jesus is offering. The poor in spirit want to go to the kingdom of heaven. Let me rephrase it this way. The poor in spirit know they need the kingdom of heaven. Which is it for you? Are you poor in spirit or proud in spirit? It seems like every single time our spirit gets puffed up with pride, God finds a way to humble us. We get pride-filled wind knocked right out of us. We all need to be poor in spirit, but we all struggle with the shadow side of pride in spirit. As for the others, do you weep with those who mourn? Are you humble in your heart? Are you merciful in your ways? Do you hunger and thirst for what is right and just in this world? Do you pray and seek each day to be more pure in heart? Do you seek to be a peacemaker and not a divider of humanity? And finally, do you accept and embrace your blessing when you are reviled and hated and even persecuted for standing up and speaking out for the right thing in the eyes of God? If you can say yes to any of these eight questions, then you have honestly placed your foot and your feet on the stairway to heaven. Maybe a simple place for each of us to begin would be to reflect upon the words of Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. These were words spoken about him. It was said of Atticus that he was a good man at home as he was on the public streets. Perhaps we could all claim this point of being as we begin to follow Jesus. Here is step one on the stairway to heaven. We live in a world where peace seems far away, from the streets of Jesus' homeland in Jerusalem and Jenin, where seven Israelis and nine Palestinians were killed this week, to the streets of Memphis, where Tyree Nichols cried out for his mother 80 yards from her home as he was being beaten to death by five police officers, only to die a few days later to the 45 mass shootings in the United States since the first day of 2023, including two in Columbus. One is the most recent American mass shooting that happened overnight and appeared in the news early this morning, to a vicious war in Ukraine now in its 12th month. We seem intent on being war makers and carnage makers, not peacemakers. This doesn't even begin to touch the wars within our hearts, within our families, and between people on a daily basis. It feels like the Beatitudes don't matter, like the Sermon on the Mount never happened. It feels like our presence for and with one another in trial and rejoicing loses its way in the world that God has given us. Nevertheless, and God is always in the nevertheless, we are here. Perhaps we present a vestige of hope. Here, like by the sea in Galilee, we can come for comfort and reassurance and faith and hope. Here, in this cathedral of grace, in this house of hope, we can come together as a family of faith. Despite our differences, we can allow further, we cannot allow further divisions to separate us. Despite our different perspectives on life in our times, even in our church, we cannot abandon our commitment to God and to one another and to people in need in our time. For the moment, let us be still and listen. Let us learn one lesson today. Let us follow Jesus. Let us do our best to live into the blessings of God. If you close your eyes when you are still, you can hear the water lapping on the shoreline of the lake in Galilee. You can hear the soft voice of Jesus commending you for blessing that you have known and that you have been for others, commending you to grow into being a blessing for everyone. We can hear the soft voice of Jesus saying, you are blessed, now go and bless others. Amen.